Good morning. I'm Malcolm Young, Dean of Grace Cathedral at San Francisco, in, at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, California. Welcome to the Winter Forum. Today, we started the forum with an exclusive preview of Sign My Name to Freedom, a feature documentary about iconic National Park Ranger Betty Reed Soskin, her hidden life as a singer-songwriter, and her family's experience confronting Jim Crow-style segregation on the West Coast. Betty gained fame as the oldest park ranger in the country after starting the job at the age of 85, and she continued working at the Rosie the Riveter National Historic Site as an interpretive oral historian until she retired at age 100. Through her experience as a World War II file clerk for an all-black auxiliary union in Richmond, she helped to reshape the national narrative about home front segregation in the workplace, labor unions, and also in the armed forces. My guests today are director and producer Brian Gibble and Betty's daughter, Diara Reed. We're going to be talking about the making of the film and about this remarkable woman, Betty Reed Soskin. Brian and Diara, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. The film was so powerful for me, I just didn't even realize it. Just, it opened up so many things for me that I just didn't even know were in there. So thank you so much for, for your work on this project. Uh, I, I think one of the things that struck me the most is, you know, it's one thing to read about Betty's life writing songs, but yeah. to hear the recordings, to see her herself, mm -hmm. um, it really, really means something very different to me than it did just reading words on a page. And I, I was wondering, you know, um, there are moments in reading the book that are so powerful. And there's several times she says, well, that, there was this me there, and this was the turning point. I, I was a different person after that. Um, but one of the most powerful moments of all, and, and Diara, this is when you were a child, uh, and your family moved out to Walnut Creek. They received, uh, as a, the second black family, like, like east of the, the, the Berkeley Hills, the Oakland Hills, uh, and received death threats and um, damage to the building site for the house that they were building. But they finally moved in, and a new black family was moving in, in uh, to, into uh, Pleasant Hill. And there was a, a, a neighborhood improvement association meeting, which was going to address this, like they were going to take action against this black family. Yeah. Um, and Betty um, went to that um, went to that like PTA kind of meeting, uh, listened to what people said, horrible racist things, and then went up and spoke herself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just like it's such an incredible act of of uh, of um, confidence and power and courage and bravery. Um, but I, I, it, it 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 seems like such a powerful moment. I just wondered how can you ever convey that in film in a way that can express the just the emotional power of that moment. That's a great question. Um, there's a number of moments in Betty's life that are expressed in the book that were never documented with photos or video. There's no visual documentation of this moment and other ones that were really pivotal for Betty. So part of what we want to do with this documentary film actually is to cast actors and do dramatic recreations where we won't hear dialogue from the actors. It will still be Betty's voice narrating her own experiences but the plan is to shoot maybe with 16 millimeter film, and almost as if there was a film crew that was there at the time. And we'll be transparent about that. We'll tell people at the beginning of the film that there'll be dramatic recreations in the project. But I really feel that film is most powerful when it takes us visually into a moment instead of just hearing about it. And so part of the reason that we're raising funds for this project is to finish the editing, but also to be able to create in a way, create archival material for these types of moments in Betty's life. And the moment that you just mentioned, actually, is really pivotal. That's one of the first moments where she found her voice as an activist, is what she's told me. And it was after that meeting, actually, she, she fled the meeting uh, once people started heckling her really viciously. She was afraid, and she burst into tears and, and ran out of the room. And she heard footsteps behind her, and she was terrified she was going to get attacked, actually. She felt a hand on her shoulder, and then a voice said, it's okay, I'm with you, I'm here to support you. And it was a man from the Unitarian Church in Walnut Creek, and Betty became a member of that church and was able to connect with progressive white folks because she was uh, and her family were the only people of color in the area because they literally crossed a Jim Crow divided color line to move into Walnut Creek when it was fully racially segregated. But that moment was pivotal for her finding her voice and becoming an activist and transforming her life and, and also transforming the area uh, through her activism. Yeah, I mean, Diara, I think about you and that Unitarian Church. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what that felt like as a child to be in, in that community or part of it or connected to it. Well, actually, um, for me, 
we moved to Walnut Creek when I was six months old. Yeah. So I was very, very young. Um, and like most families, um, adults don't tell kids when things are going on. Yeah. So a lot of these things I didn't learn until I read the blog. I had no knowledge of these things because my parents, I guess, were protecting me you know, and the rest of us. But I mean, pr even prior to the Neighborhood Association event, my mother also found out that there was going to be a minstrel show at my brother's oh, yeah. elementary school. And she went up and confronted the principal. Um, and I think that was really probably the first time she... <sighs> I mean, you got to understand, my parents were in their mid-20s, an African-American family that had a very successful record store in Berkeley that was able to purchase land in Walnut Creek and thought that, yes, their generation would be able to live the American dream. And so, you know, my parents were kind of like the couple out of GQ. I mean, really stylish and everything. And yeah. My mom was like the housewife of, you know, the Barbie generation. Um, and I think that was the first time she really said, oh, hell no. Um, I got to do something. Yeah. And she went up and confronted them. And when they had the performance, she and her friends sat there in the front row and made them perform it in front of her. Yeah, and I also like the fact that she also got up ahead of time and 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 expressed her mm -hmm. her her what this really meant. Like it gave it a context so that people in the audience would understand. Yeah, I mean she's a tremendously brave person at all these different stages. I, I mean, again, the music was so powerful to me. I, I mean, could you tell me a little bit, Diara, about what it was like growing up with her? Like, how conscious of the music were you? I mean, how, how like what did it strike you as when you were a kid? Like to have your mom making these beautiful songs. Well, you know, as being a child, I mean. My mom drug me to church. <laughs> My mom drug me to wherever she had it. The guitar and the kids, come on, get in the station wagon, let's go. And I would like, you know, listen to her. It's like, yeah, there's my mom. <laughs> but then I would look around and everybody would be like, oh, God, your mother is just so great. Her music is so... I'm like, wow, who are these people talking about? You know? And it wasn't until later years that, you know, that I really was able to appreciate her as a songwriter, as a woman, as an activist. You know, when she started to come out of that shell of being mom, you know, because I mean, we build walls up about our parents when we're growing up. You know, that's the last thing I want to do is to be like my parent, right? And I have to say, Every day I get reminded now that you look just like your mother. <laughs> you act just like your mother. And I'm like, wow, that's really a compliment. Yeah. I mean, she's an awesome woman. Yeah, so true. That's so true. You know, um, you know, the 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 afterwards that story is that um, you know, when she left that stage of her life and and um remarried after being married to your dad. Um, you know, her new husband um, made some critical comments about, you know, how she might improve her songwriting, et cetera. And it, it was kind of the end of that. I mean, um, which uh, was so heartbreaking. And when you read it in the Bob blog, it must have been, it must have made you cry. Um, but I, I wonder uh, it, what other ways that you saw her being kind of shut down, uh, you know, too. Because there, there, um, there are obstacles that she faced that she overcame. And there, there are obstacles that kind of made her retreat into herself a little bit more. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that in her, in her life, and in all of our life, I guess. Well, my mother, um, my mother, like transforms every ten years. I mean, I just throughout her life. Um, I see that once we got free of Walnut Creek. She was the last one to leave, and then she, my parents had divorced, and she remarried, and she became a, you know, a university wife, or, you know, a professor's eye candy, basically. And when that was kind of like falling apart, she kind of came back down 
from the hills, took over Reed's records because my father was in ill health. And she became another activist for the community um, and got reborn again. She was a businesswoman. Uh, she morphed into working in city politics. And from there, they kind of leap. Well, I came back after being away from the store and took the store over and freed her so she could go be a field representative for Dion Ariner, which led her to the park. So it's like she would go through different stages of her life. You got to remember, this is a woman who was born in 1921. What was possible for her when she was a teenager, she could not have imagined being able to achieve when she was after 50. Yeah. You know, she didn't have a college education. College was out of the question. It was either marry good or be an agricultural worker or clean somebody's house. So for her to get to these different stages, it was like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. Because my mother lives in the moment. She doesn't think about yesterday, and she does not plan about tomorrow. And everybody says she's so brave, but she's not. Everybody says she's so confident, but she's not. But because the moment is not clear what she wants, she changes it in the moment. When she sees something's wrong, she changes it right then. And that's the strength that she has. And she, I've seen her do it over and over and over. Yeah, I, I think about, too, you're so right. I mean, she just the whole range of opportunities she's had has been different in each mm -hmm. decade. Because you're right, I mean, she writes about like what her options were when she left Castlemont High School and, um, and it, you know, married your dad. And you're right, a decision that you make when you're 20, given like those three options, um, it, it's going to look like 20 years later when there are so many more options. It's, it's going to be a, a completely different picture. You know, um, I'm so glad you, you, you have, you're so close to the record store. I, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about just the history of the record store in your family, how it came into being. I mean, it, it did kind of put you at the center of cultural life in the East Bay. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, about that. Well, my parents started the store because my mother at that point was working in the shipyard. She had quit from a job with the Air Force because... They thought she was Caucasian, and she wasn't, and the word got out, and they told her, all, well, you know, you can stay, because we asked all of your co-workers if they'd be all right for you to be there, and they said yes, and my mother said, well, will I get my raises, and will I get my position in authority, will they, will they accept that? And he said, well, well, you'll get your raises, but, you know, just calm down. So she immediately went to her desk, picked up her stuff, and left. And my father had, um, when the war broke out, he enlisted. He wanted to fight for his country. My father was an athlete, a pro athlete, but before African Americans could play professional. He was semi-pro, and he was very, very, very famous in the black community. And he went off um, to boot camp and saw that the only opportunity he was going to be is to be a cook. And he wanted to fight. And they told him, well, listen, you, you're too much of a leader. If you're on a ship with other men, uh, you might have a problem with mutiny, so go home. So in that, my parents were kind of like, well, all these folks are coming in from the southern states because of the war effort and the home front. All of a sudden, there's a market for race music. So they had a duplex on Sacramento Street. They cut out a hole in the garage and had, had uh, milk cartons for put this, the LPs in and uh, you know a cigar box for the cash register. And the Bendix washing machine was the safe. And my mother... <laughs> would sell records out of the garage. And it just morphed into a huge, you know, well, for the black community, um, business. I mean, Reed's Records lasted. I was, I was running it for the last 30 years of its existence. It ran for 75 years. And we were supported by 98% African Americans. 
And that was our world. Um, so, you know, my parents just said, we're not going to work for white folks no more. And they opened up their own business. Yeah, yeah. And that gave them a, a totally different freedom, totally mm-hmm. different op- options. Um, so it, uh, it closed down in 2019. What were just some of the, what was kind of behind that? I mean, uh, it, it just it lived a great life. Um, it, 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 how, did, how did you make the decision to, to move on to the next stage? Well, it wasn't that I made a decision to make the, I, you know, I was just, I had to be drug out because I was kicking and screaming. I wasn't yeah, ready yeah. to leave because yeah. it was not supposed to happen on my watch. But it happened earlier in my father's tenure over this store in the 60s and the 70s when the discount record stores started opening up and taking our customers because they could get supplies cheaper than we could get. Well, Apple, music came along, right. Walmart came along, and then Amazon. Yeah. There was nothing left. Yeah, yeah, definitely the technology change. You know, um, one of the most powerful parts of reading the book is something that's so obvious, and everybody in the room knows this except for me, um, and that is, uh, you know, Henry J. Kaiser goes to you know, five southern states um, and brings a massive number of people. So, you know, I, I was certainly aware that R- R- Richmond's population went from 21,000 to 130,000, like, mm-hmm. overnight. Um, and each of those families, so there's black families that came from the South and there are white families that came. Black families came with this hope for like equality in the future. And the white families, um, you know, brought that Jim Crow segregation that they'd never known anything different with them. Um, I wonder, Brian, if you can talk a little bit about just that dynamic as, as, uh, as, as everyone arrives here for the wartime years. And then, you know, what do you do with these, these groups of people afterwards? And what was their experience after, after um, the war ended? Sure. Um, as DR mentioned, the armed forces were still segregated at that time. And so were the labor unions. So Henry Kaiser sent recruiters down to the south, primarily recruiting folks to come to the East Bay to work in the home front effort. As you mentioned, building ships in the Kaiser shipyards. Um, But because the labor unions were segregated, Betty, for instance, wanted to join up and become a Rosie, riveting, but she couldn't because uh, African-American workers were put into auxiliary unions, as she mentions, which were just assisting the main labor unions. It wasn't until 1944 that African-American women started getting trained as riveters. Uh, And housing stock was segregated as well. So the federal government was building housing for folks that were coming in for the war effort. And there was housing for black workers and for white workers. The housing, as you might imagine, for black workers was much poorer conditions. And um, there was actually a fire that Betty helped to uncover uh, in one of the black housing units that killed dozens of people and was never really widely reported on even at the time. And Betty was able to do some detective work looking through old photographs and uncover that this fire had happened and that people were basically um, buried without um, much recognition at all. And so those situations continued even after the war. Eventually, residential segregation was not formalized, but it stayed in an informal way through redlining in which real estate uh, agents and real estate agencies and commissions only sold housing based on race. And so certain areas were for white folks, other areas were for black folks. There were also restrictive covenants that were put in place in the deeds of homes so that it would be written into the deed that this home could only be sold to a white person like in perpetuity, effectively. And that affected the whole Bay Area. Um, Berkeley, for instance, there's a clip that I wasn't able to include in this work sample but that will be in the full film. There's a news reporter in like 1963, something around that time, standing on Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley, which is a very iconic street, and and he says, this is the dividing line. African-Americans can't buy housing above Shattuck Avenue. So that was fully segregated at the time, and I didn't know this before I found that news clip and before I started doing this research. I think a lot of people don't realize that Berkeley had stark, stark divisions, as did much of the Bay Area, and as Betty and her family found out, they actually wanted to move into another part of Berkeley before moving to Walnut Creek, but they couldn't buy property there. So they ended up moving to Walnut Creek, and the only way they could do that was that um, Mel, Diara's dad, had a friend who was married to a white woman who purchased property for them and then turned it over to them so that they were able to get that property, and they built their home there. And Betty talks a little bit in the clip about 
what, the, what their experiences were afterwards. So I would say that the legacy of that influx and migration of folks and maybe the influx as well of Jim Crow segregation continues to mark the area, but it's a history that's not widely spoken about. And that's one of our goals with this film is to address that more directly. We'd like to have the film and Betty's memoir incorporated into high school history classes as required material uh, throughout the state. Because I think unless we're really upfront and open about our own history, we can't make changes to the current context. And that's one of the goals for the film. Yeah, that's, that's very important. I, um, Adiara, I think about um, your mom coming and being at the record store and um, beginning to work for local politicians. Um, so, so how did she begin to get involved with um, members of the California Assembly? You know, how did she, how did she kind of make her way into that world? Because that was another incarnation which we didn't talk very much about and wasn't in the film very much. Well, actually, she was working. She was running the record store, and at Sacra well, if you don't know, Sacramento Street is in South Berkeley, and South Berkeley traditionally has been the area where vices happen. And it's all right because the police know where it's contained at. So, you know, in this, probably the five block area around the shop in the 90s and the 80s, there was more murders there than anywhere in Berkeley um, because it was all drug related. They, you know, it was a drug candy store. And the neighborhood had, had gotten dilapidated, um, just urban blight. And my mother was um, the squeaky wheel at the city council. And she started working um, with one of the council members. And she got a redevelopment project done for Sacramento Street, which tore out all the blight and put in uh, housing. Um, so that was her first foray into it. And that she, when I came into the store, it freed her up. So she got a job with, with the assembly woman, Deanna Allen Ariner. And, Lani, Lonnie and Hancock afterwards, once Dion turned out. Um, but I think the thing that is really essential here is my mother didn't go to college. She was a high school graduate. She wasn't technically qualified to do any of this, but she did a fantastic job of whatever she touched. Yeah, what made her so good in, in, with politics? Like, what, what was, I mean, what did you learn from her and in, in her interaction with the political world? You know, she seemed very good at it. <laughs> well, I can frame it as my mother, I describe her as she is unapologetically Betty. She's not as afraid to speak her mind. Um, and some people don't like that, but. She really has her finger on things, and it, she's usually right. I hate to say it, but she's usually right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I mean, and she doesn't budge when she goes there. I mean, it takes a while for her to get there, yeah. but once she sees she's adamant about something, then she'll fight for it. And, and Brian, um, how did you first meet her, and how did this project kind of begin? Because you're right. I mean, I totally think every, every kid in high school should read this. I mean, yeah. Well, I first came about this project, actually, I learned about Betty the way a lot of people learned about Betty. Um, I heard, I think, a piece on NPR about this amazing park ranger. Yeah. And um, as a reporter at the time, I started just doing a little bit more research, and I found her blog and started reading stories on her blog that struck me as even more powerful than the work that this woman is doing as a park ranger. And there was an article that she'd posted on her blog that was a cover article from the East Bay Express from 1989 and it was about Reed's records. And it was this beautiful piece about Reed's records, and it, you know, I found that the store was still open, so I went down to the store, and my original plan was to do a short film about the record store, because it just felt like a location that embodies so much history and so much relevance for, for the Bay Area. And I walked in and met Diara and chatted about the project that I wanted to do, and Diara said I needed to meet her mom. Uh, because Betty opened the record store with Mel in 1945. And I went to the park and heard Betty speak and then um, spoke with her afterwards. And the next week I went over to her apartment and we chatted. And I was asking her all kinds of questions about her life outside of her work as a ranger that predated her work as a ranger. And at the time there was this media flurry around Betty, but people weren't asking these questions. It was 
sort of articles that were feeding off themselves and there was this beautiful story that people kept retelling without digging deeper. And so we really connected. I spoke with her for probably two hours and we became friends almost immediately and she sent me away that day with a box full of old uh, eight millimeter home movies that Mel had shot with the family. Wow. Um, and it, I got them digitized and some of them went back to the 40s. There was a home movie of Betty getting married to Mel wow. in South Berkeley in 1942, I believe. Wow. And all of this incredible material, some of which you saw in the film, you saw little clips of it. Uh, and that just really inspired me to push forward on that film. And it wasn't until maybe four or five months into working on that project, I was digitizing and scanning all of these photographs that Betty had in books. And she mentioned to me, she asked if I'd like to hear some of her music. And I hadn't read on her blog about her music, although there are a few posts of it on there. So I said, of course. Uh, and she dug through a stack of old, like, homemade burned CDs and pulled one out, finally found it, here it is, and put it in, and it skipped a few times at first. And then this song came on. And it's not in the clip that you saw, but it will be in the full film, and it's called Ebony the Night. And it's a song that Betty wrote in 1967 after attending a Black Power conference for the Unitarian Church in Chicago. And it's about her realization coming from Walnut Creek, where she was surrounded by white folks. Uh, she realized that black really is beautiful and that it's something that shouldn't be looked down upon, but actually should be celebrated. And now that's something that many of us have heard, but at the time that was still, I guess, um, a contentious notion. And she wrote this song that's stunning. It's absolutely spectacular. And I almost fell out of my chair when I heard it. I couldn't believe what I was listening to. And she's sitting there like, what do you think? Do you like it? And I was like, I, yes, of course. I was completely taken aback. And I felt like I had just discovered, like, it was like if Billie Holiday was never discovered. Yeah. And here she is. I'm sitting right next to her. And there's a, like a homemade CD. And she's playing this music for me. And she mentioned to me then that she has a box, uh, a bin, a plastic bin in the back of her closet with old reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And did she think I, that that could be useful for me? I said, of course. And um, in that bin, there were probably 50 reel-to-reel -reel tapes. But Betty had thrown out and gotten rid of years ago her reel-to-reel -reel player. So she had no way of playing the music. And reel-to-reel -reel tapes are, they contain magnetic tape. It's like an analog form of tape. And I did some research, and it turns out that over time it deteriorates. And there's instances I've heard of where you'll play back a song, and the way that it works, there's a playback reel, and then there's an uptake reel. So it plays through one, one part of the player, and then it gets spooled onto another reel on another part of the player. And I've read about stories where you'll play a tape, and you'll hear it, and then on the uptake reel, if it's old tape, the magnetic tape will fall off and there'll be a little pile of oh, dust next crazy. to it, yeah. and you never get to hear it again. So you hear it once at times, and that can be it. So I was terrified to play the music at that point, and yeah. um, eventually raised some funding and got the, the tapes digitized professionally. And none of them were in that bad of shape, but I wanted to be sure. And in those boxes of reel-to-reel -reel tapes, some of them had nothing. They were like, it had been like dubs of the radio, right? And there were things that were completely irrelevant but there were 20, probably 20, original songs. Um, and many of them were recorded during live performances because Betty was only, like maybe once or twice recorded in a studio setting. And that was only for very limited songs. And her songs are all autobiographical. So they are literally narrating her experiences through the 50s and 60s and early 70s. She'll talk before the songs and introduce them to an audience and tell people what they're about. And it's mostly music that is just Betty on guitar and then singing her music. And there's, there's one recording that she did with a jazz quartet. And I think her music is so important and relevant musically. It's very complex musically and also socially. And so along with the film, our plan is to release an album of Betty's music for the first time because this music has never been released publicly. There's maybe one, two songs that were released on a 45-inch record from a tiny label out of like um, Oakland. There were probably a few hundred copies that were printed um, and very few that are left over. And so we really feel, the filmmaking team and I, that it's time for her music to be released. And she feels that way uh, as well. It's fascinating because as you mentioned, she left her music behind definitively. 
Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why she did that. Partly, she says she was, she was being courted by record labels to become a professional singer because of her talent. And she said she was afraid of succeeding, not of failing, because she has a special needs daughter, and then her other children were dealing with trauma coming out of Walnut Creek, where they had integrated a racist white neighborhood and, and had a lot of challenges as a result. So she was afraid of being taken on the road and becoming successful and not being able to be there for her family. But also, her second husband made this comment to her that, well, he listened to a song that she had just finished writing, and he said, that's great, Betty. Maybe I can get you into Berkeley and you can learn how to be a real singer-songwriter. And she was silent and stunned and never wrote another song again after that. And I think in some ways, she, maybe she regrets that. And now, as, as Diara mentioned, Betty doesn't look into the past so much. She does if it's a historical issue as an interpretive ranger and she's talking about segregation. But in her own life, she tends to be either in the present and moving ahead. And this music um, caused her, listening to it again, caused her to reflect on a, a past time in her life in a way that she doesn't typically do. And she, there's times where she said, I didn't realize you know, the value of my own work then, but I can hear it now. And so she feels it's really important for this music to have a second life. And the songs were reinterpreted by a number of musicians during the filming of the documentary, uh, younger musicians and other folks as well. And so our plan is to release an album that contains her original songs, but also interpretations by other younger musicians as well. And um, our goal is to do that while Betty's still around to be able to experience that. She's 102, and Diara can speak much more in much more depth about how she's doing now, because Diara is her primary caretaker. Um, but we really, really want to have this documentary and the music released while she can be around to enjoy Yeah, I mean, that for me, I, I, mean, I don't know how you felt, Diara, the first time you saw your mom singing on film or heard mm. it. But I mean, it, it, so the lyrics of the, the song that you mentioned are in the book. Mm. And, you know, she, your mom talks about like, being interested, in, like lo loving Sarah Vaughn and Billie Holiday, you know, or, or coming to appreciate Billie Holiday. I mean, it just didn't, it, I just didn't realize until I saw her singing just how, how powerful that, in part, yeah. she, she's modest and, you know, totally. um, but I, you know, I think that probably would be good. Maybe, Amjara, you could tell us a little bit just about how your mom's doing. And um, I think a lot of people are, are, are concerned about her, think about her, hope she's doing okay. Well, I also like to say that, you know, her music was born out of a mental breakdown. It was how she dealt with her trauma and her recovery. So her music is much more important to me than just a singer and a songwriter. Um, my mother is 102. A year ago, we were traveling together to the East Coast to go to different events and, um, you know, getting honorary doctorates and everything else. But now it's hard to get her out of her bed. Um, she's winding down and she feels like she's completed what she was meant to complete in all her lifetime but it sure would be nice for one more project to be completed while she's still here yeah so this is my quest to try to give back to my mother while she's still here. And like anything, anything else in life, things cost. And we are trying to raise funds to get this thing done. Um, we've knocked on a lot of big doors, but no one's yet to answer. And time is click is ticking. You know, I don't know. I mean, I told Pastor earlier that my days start with going from my bedroom and cracking her door and seeing if she's breathing. And I'm hoping that this will get done before that day that I find that she's not. Well, Diara, we're so grateful for the love that you have for your mom and just the way that you're taking care of her. Um, and for both of you, I mean, uh, there's so much richness that just, 
that, um, that you are preserving that would otherwise be lost and, and such an important story that it's not, just, um, it's not just your mom's story, but it's the story, you know, our story too. We're, we're part of this in um, all sorts of different ways. I'm so grateful for the two of you waking up so early, you know, the work that you've done so far on the film. Uh, and thank you very much for being with us this morning. We're very, very grateful. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us.